Hey everybody and welcome to episode 94 of How I Built It. In this episode, I talk to Jeremy Green about his paywall plugin, Leaky Paywall. I thought it was a really interesting project and he happened to reach out to me around the same time that I heard him on another podcast, which I thought was very interesting. Uh, So I really enjoyed talking to him. Uh, We get pretty deep into developer stuff, local development, using, uh, you know, GitHub and some of the workflows around GitHub and things like that. He also provides some really interesting insights on how people consume information uh, and kind of the reasoning behind why you would put some stuff behind a paywall. I also want to tell you about the new shop over at howibuilt.it slash shop. We've got t-shirts and mugs, and I'm very excited to bring those things to market. We have all sorts of colors, and we have both men and women's cuts in the t-shirt options. So head over to howibuilt.it slash shop to see everything we have to offer there. Today's episode is brought to you by Pantheon and a new sponsor, Tech Memes Ride Home Podcast. You'll hear about both of them later. So for now, on with the show. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of How I Built It, the podcast that asks, how did you build that? Today, my guest is Jeremy Green of Zine 101. Jeremy, how are you today? I'm doing great. Awesome. Thanks so much for being here. Uh, Jeremy serendipitously reached out to me uh, on the same day that I listened to an episode of the Post Status Draft podcast where I heard about him and his product, Leaky Paywall. So uh, it was... Uh, a little bit of repetition I saw there, so I'm, I'm very excited to have you on the show. Um, so why don't we jump right into it? Jeremy, why don't you tell uh, the audience uh, who you are and what you do? Sure. Yeah, my name is Jeremy Green. I'm out in Fort Collins, Colorado, and I've been building websites for clients for about the past eight years. And about four years ago, me and a couple other guys uh, decided to start a little side project company called Zine 101. Uh, building plugins and tools for publishers. And so right now we build websites and then also work on our products kind of on the side, um, making improvements to them as we build sites with them. Nice. So uh, when you say that you uh, build uh, WordPress sites for um, publishers, you mean like people who are uh, creating maybe like um, online magazines or or Mm -hmm. newspapers, stuff like that? Yeah, yeah. So our main focus is magazine publishers who are trying to go digital um, and then local newspapers as well who are trying to go digital. Nice. Nice. And do you find that that's like a a good niche to be in niche or niche, however you want to pronounce it? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah, absolutely. There's, uh, you know, a lot of people need help in that space. um, And so there's definitely a ton of opportunity there. So we've been pushing, pushing really hard for the last couple of years in that space. Nice. And, uh, so you have the client side of things and then you have the uh, product side of things. And, and we're going to be focusing uh, mostly on leaky paywall today. Mm-hmm. Um, but you do have kind of several other products. Are these all products that came out of client requests? Yeah, pretty much. So it all started with uh, client requests to uh, for our issue M plugin, which basically lets you create magazines online, gives you issues and stuff. And then from that, a client wanted a way to kind of do a leaky paywall style um, functionality. So originally it was built just for that integration with issue M plugin. Um, And then, you know, we had another request for it that, you know, didn't involve issue M. And so we decided, hey, this could be a cool idea for a plugin. So then we pulled it out as its own uh, and started doing development just on leaky paywall. Gotcha. Very cool. So um, and and that's that seems like a pretty. a regular path for the the freelancers or the the people who are doing client services is they get enough of a request from a, uh, enough clients to say mm-hmm. hey this is probably a useful plugin um so did you do any other research uh as far as creating uh let's let's uh change gears now and focus completely on leaky paywall so sure uh first maybe you could tell us a little bit about what exactly that is and then if you did any other research outside of client requests yeah for sure so leaky paywall is basically a membership plugin uh but has a different way it restricts content so instead of it being a hard paywall where you know content is completely locked down 
Um, it, it allows the user to kind of choose what content they want to view before they reach that that hard paywall and have to pay or you know give their email address or wherever you set it up to be able to access the rest of the content. So that's basically how it works. Um, and then, sorry, what was the other question? <laughs> uh, about research, but actually, I'm glad we paused there because uh, it's so uh, if we're if we're kind of equating functionality, right? It's like the mm-hmm. Uh, you read five articles or three articles from the New York Times, and then it says, "Hey, you hit your limit for the month. Uh, if you want to pay to read the rest, go on ahead." Mm-hmm. That's that's uh, a good use case for this plugin, right? Yep, that's exactly what it does. Perfect. So uh, now moving on to uh, the second part of that question, um, you said that you had a few client requests for this type of functionality. Did you do any other research uh, before mm-hmm. or while developing the plugin? Yeah, I mean, we kind of looked uh, looked around to see what other options were out there, um, and most of the other kind of leaky paywall style things were, you know, SaaS services that mm. took a share of the revenue. Gotcha. Uh, so we decided to kind of go the WordPress plugin route, so we don't take any revenue share or anything from publishers, so they keep, you know, the all their subscriber revenue. Um, we just make our money from add-ons and client services. Gotcha. That I mean, that seems like a very desirable model for the publishers, right? Because uh, I mean, making making money as a publisher is hard, especially if you're going mm-hmm. to go the the paywall route, yep. uh, and it's uh, very unappetizing to want to give up a share of that to uh, have your main revenue driver. I would say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's what we found too, especially with like the small and medium sized publisher, uh, which is where we're really focused on. You know they can't really afford to lose thirty percent of their subscriber revenue. Wow, that is a that is a lot more <laughs> than I was thinking in my head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you know it, it. Different programs, different softwares do have different revenue shares, but you know, it's just kind of the the, the general level. Gotcha. So, so do you offer a free version of the plugin on the repository, and then sell the add-ons, or is there like a premium version of the plugin? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we have leaky paywalls free on the repo, and then we have add-ons that add additional functionality uh, onto it. We actually started as a completely premium plugin, and we decided to make the core functionality free a couple of years ago just to try to get some more get some more exposure, get more people using it. Gotcha. And has that worked out for you? Uh, it has, as far as getting our name out there. Um, it's really increased the amount of publishers that we've been able to work with because uh, they find our plug-in and then they reach out. So we have a lot more connections with publishers now. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I'd imagine that it's probably a good way for you to not only sell more uh, copies of the plugin or the add-ons, but also maybe get some extra client work on the side. Mm-hmm, exactly. Man, that's that's fantastic. So, uh, what is what's in the free version of the plugin? Is it like uh, you know e- email ask or is there some payment? Is there payment processing mm-hmm. in in the free version? Yeah. So the free version uh, ha- comes with PayPal standard and then also Stripe uh, built into it. Wow. So you can start pay- tar- taking payments right away. Um, if you want to do recurring payments um, or something like that, then we have an add on for that. But out of the box, you can use Stripe or PayPal. Wow, that's that's fantastic! So people can start making money with your plugin right mm-hmm. away, no money down, yep. thirty day guarantee, all that <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Today's episode is brought to you by Pantheon. WordPress five point and the new editor Gutenberg are coming. Are you prepared? Do you want to learn about the changes in advance? Pantheon has gathered resources to help you prepare including webinars and tutorials. Pantheon also has made it easy and free to try Gutenberg with your site before the official launch. Visit pantheon.io slash Gutenberg. Let them know that How I Built It sent you. And now, back to the show. This is always really interesting to me. Um, When you were figuring out kind of what to make free and what to have as an (laughs) add-on, did you... Did you talk to people? Did you talk to your clients? Did you just get feedback from users? Did you talk to other uh, professionals in the space? How did that look with the decision making process? Yeah, I mean, we we just talked to you know we saw all the requests that were coming in either through the support forum on WordPress.org or you know our support ticket system to see what people wanted. And kind of our kind of benchmark was if it was something that helped the publisher make money, then we should probably charge for it. 
So that was kind of our, our baseline that we used when deciding whether to make something free or just put it into the core plugin. Um, you know, it's not 100% that way, but for the most part, that was what we used to figure out what to what to charge for and what not to charge for. Yeah, and, and that makes sense, right? I, I, I've always said the easiest sell is is the sell that you can apply a direct value to, right? It's like, mm-hmm. if you buy this add-on, you can start making money immediately, right? So Yep. Yep, exactly. Awesome. Very cool. Um, so uh, I, I do have uh, one more question kind of about the features before we get to the title question. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it looks like you have like IP uh, exceptions add on and add dropper and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, how much of that c- came from um, or maybe the implementation? Because uh, you kind of answered this question already. But uh, how much of this came from your domain knowledge of working with? Uh, publishers on the Mm -hmm. client side as well right because um you know i think a lot of well i'll do it too i'll say like oh i could totally build something like that but i'm not like in the industry and i don't have the domain knowledge so how much of that domain knowledge like helps you um create features and relate Mm -hmm. them to you know write the copy like writing copy is so hard i think right Yeah, no, I mean, 100%, I would say, like, you know, we have client requests as we're building a site, and we're like, oh, that's a great idea. We should build that for this client and then create an add-on for it. Um, So, yeah, we do that all the time. You know, like IP restrictions, you know, there was a request for, you know, a lot of people in the publishing industry, you know, sell publications to, like, libraries Mm -hmm. or universities, Mm -hmm. right? So they needed a way to give people with an IP address access without, you know, the user having to log in and stuff. And so that came directly out of a client request. And then we just generalize it to to make it an add-on. So, you know, most of our new add-ons that we come out are directly related to problems or needs that we see that publishers have. Gotcha. And understanding that neither of us are lawyers, um, what is, (laughs) uh, you know, I guess the open source helps in giving you the ability to do that, right? Because... Um, you know, I know like a lot of, well, when I did freelance work, my client or my contract was always, uh, well, you completely own everything unless kind of stated otherwise, unless I built Mm -hmm. it previously. Um, so does, does open source help with that? Are your, uh, are your clients kind of keen on you doing stuff like that? Yeah, we usually, you know, for, for a client work, it's usually pretty customized. Mm -hmm. So we'll take the idea and we customize it specifically for them. And then after the fact, we'd more generalize it, you gotcha. know, and then I'll put in all the hooks and filters needed to, you know, if someone else wants to customize it as they need. Uh, but it's, you know, a pretty generalized version of what we actually build for the client. Cool. Very cool. Yeah, I, I like that a lot. That sounds really cool. It sounds well, uh, you know, I do video work for people and I try to toe that line as well. Right. Yeah. You mm-hmm. can't you can't exactly copyright teaching something. You can just copyright the content that uh, came out of that teaching sort of thing. So, Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's a very similar model to what I take and and very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll I'll even say with that real quick, we have some people that, you know, we don't do full site builds for, they just need a custom functionality. mm -hmm. And so we'll actually say, okay, we'll develop it for you. You know, we'll give you a discount, but we're going to create an add on out of it. So that's another way that we handle that as well. Oh, and that's great. Right. Cause then you're getting a little seed money to, to, build out you know Mm -hmm. your business which is really cool i like that a lot yep nice uh well we are about at the halfway point which is like which is when i like to ask the title question uh which is how did you build it um you uh you touched on you know uh, a, a little bit of that um you you'll get client requests you'll build something specific you'll generalize it with hooks and plugins but what does your development process look like Mm-hmm. Yep. So we have uh, me and then a couple other developers that work on it um, kind of part time. And so, you know, personally, I just use Sublime Text uh, and we have everything up on GitHub. So Leaky Paywall itself is up on a pl- public repo and all our add ons are on private repos. And we nice. try to use the Git flow model mm-hmm. uh, to kind of create feature branches, work on stuff there, push everything together and then push it out to the repo uh, from there. So we're working on adding more automation and stuff like that um but you know it's just a lot of uh reading other people's code too and just seeing what other people are doing in this space you know because the membership plugin isn't new um but kind of our take on it is a little bit different so just kind of seeing what other people are doing take best practices um, and then try to incorporate that into our plugins 
Nice. That's fantastic. And and so you mentioned Git Flow. Mm-hmm. Um, I always I always mess up Git and Git Flow and Git Hub Flow. Uh, and then there was like another one introduced to me recently. <laughs> so um, and I think this is a, this is a fun question, and I don't know that I've asked it on the show before. So um, mm-hmm. my development process used to be feature branch to like the dev branch, and then once we felt the dev branch was ready, we would merge that right into master. A mm-hmm. new, uh, well, new to me, I guess, as of a few months ago, was uh, feature branch to dev branch, test it on the dev branch, then feature branch to master branch. Um, and then at some point, you kind of merge master back into dev to make sure that everything is in sync. Um, mm. is, is your flow one of the above or none of the above? Yeah, so we just have a, a master and dev branch, mm-hmm. and then we just create the feature branches uh, off of master. Do all the do all the work there. Once everything's good, and we create a feature branch with all those, or excuse me, a release branch with all those features in it, and then you know test all that out across everyone's environments. You know, try to catch any bugs that we can, uh, and then push everything up to the develop and master branches, and then push those out. Nice, nice. I dig that. And then you have kind of a nice, uh, you know, similar to what you see in Subversion, right? With all the kind of release the version numbers mm-hmm. as branches. Yep. Um, cool. I like that a lot. And then you mentioned that uh, you were working on some, um, well, first of all, actually, let's let's back up a little bit. You have the public, uh, the public repo, which is the mm-hmm. core plugin. Uh, mm-hmm. And then you have add-ons as private repos. Uh, mm-hmm. How do you, do you like pull in the core plugin any old way or do you do it? Um, is that a, is that something you do locally? So I know people will use like Composer or um, uh, something I haven't used in a long time, so I can't remember, but it's like uh, pulling in a, a repo within GitHub. Um, right, right. You know, Submodules you, and stuff like that. Submodule, that's it. Yeah, I, yeah. I, as soon as we stopped using it at, at my old company, I forgot about it because <laughs> I hated it. Um, do you do anything like that? Yeah, no, personally, I keep it really simple. Um, you know, most of my day to day is client work stuff. So I try, I don't have time to get too much in the weeds on the, the development process on the plugin side of things. So I just keep it really simple, pull down, you know, both of the repos locally, have all the add ons in one install, make sure nothing breaks whenever we have something new and then, then push it up. So it's not very complicated. You know, you can definitely get pretty complicated. Um, I'm in that the post status Slack, and I've asked the question, you know, how how do you guys do a development? You know, because I'm just figuring this stuff out on my own. I've never had anyone teach me or anything like that, and so it's just it's really cool to to learn what other people do and then you know take little pieces here and there. But you know, I like to keep it as simple as possible. Oh, absolutely. And I'm like 11 years out of college now. I'm almost 10 years out of grad school, and well, we didn't really touch on development processes like that, <laughs> and and it was more like we use Java primarily, so. Um, Mm -hmm. but I definitely prefer keeping it simple. You know, I miss the days where I could just open up a code editor and write code and then, Hey, you know, it works Mm -hmm. or whatever. Now you need to like do the node and the build and the whatever. And Uh, I know I remember uh, when there wasn't CSS. So (laughs) (laughs) nice. I was coming in like right when CSS was starting to get big. So, uh, Mm. I knew just enough to, to, write html without css and then my friend showed me css and i was like what is this amazing (laughs) thing Uh, Uh, like right before i got set in my ways so um but now that's where i'm at and people you know so um so do you use like a a linter or automated tests or anything i uh i interviewed pippin a while ago i guess it was over Mm -hmm. a year ago now and um you know he said that he likes to keep his development environment so light that if his laptop fell into a lake he could go buy mm-hmm. a new one and be up and running in an hour. Yeah. And I loved that. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I basically just use Larav- uh, Laravel Valet for local development. So, I mean, nice. I could spin that up in five seconds and, you know, be ready to rock again. So nice. Laravel Valet. I've, I've been hearing, I use local by flywheel because um, mm-hmm. development's not really my day to day anymore. As, you know, I do mostly video stuff. Um, but I've been hearing a lot of good things about Laravel Valet. I'm definitely going to have to check it out. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Cool. Um, sweet. So, uh, so, oh, I, this is, this is fun. I get to ask these two questions. I usually, usually it's all covered in like the whole big story. Um, <laughs> but, uh, what kind of transformations has your product gone, gone through since it first launched? You know, uh, I'm really curious to see if, uh, you, you kind of alluded to this, but it started off as, 
um, kind of a client plugin first that you maybe generalized mm-hmm. into a public plugin, and then kind of how did it evolve from that? Yeah, so it started. It only worked with you know, like I said, that issue and plugin that we have, and then we added post types uh, restrictions so that way it would work with any site. Um, and then it used to be you know only premium, and then we decided to make it you know the core part free. So that was a big change. Um, so those were kind of the biggest transformations as far as what what it's come from. And then we, you know we've added lots of functionality to it. Like it used to only have you know subscribe cards that just had like Stripe checkout, uh, so you couldn't really do like registration forms. Uh, mm-hmm. So that was a big update whenever we pushed out the ability to do that. Um, you know, and then you know over time we've just been adding a feature here, a feature there. This episode is brought to you by the Tech Meme Ride Home Podcast. You may have heard of TechMeme.com, which is a great tech news site that you can check multiple times a day. Tech Meme Ride Home distills all the great content from TechMeme.com into daily 15 to 20 minute long episodes. You get top stories, posts, tweets, and conversations every day around 5 p.m. Eastern. It's like NPR's Marketplace, but for tech news. The show is hosted by Brian McCullough, who also hosts the Internet History Podcast. To listen, you can use your favorite podcast app to search for Ride Home and then subscribe. Get your tech news daily from the Tech Meme Ride Home Podcast today. How important is working on mobile for you because i've heard i heard some very insane stats recently about the number of people who consume news <laughs> media on mobile devices mm-hmm. yeah i mean obviously you know making sure everything's responsive and stuff like that a lot of that it's kind of difficult with a plugin though because it's not the theme right and so you know theme styles can make stuff look ugly pretty quick Right. Um, we've seen some pretty bad ones out the, out in the wild, especially in, you know, local newspaper stuff. But, mm-hmm. um, yeah, so, you know, obviously having that mobile experience is good. Um, you know, the big thing we push, too, with with our publisher clients is the, the email list building and getting that. And then most people are reading stuff on email and then, you know, sending people to the website from their uh, from, you know, when they're checking email on their phone or whatever. Um, so just making sure that the site itself is is mobile optimized. But obviously, you know, we can't do that from the plugin side of things only if we help with the right. site. So, yeah, absolutely. It's it, that's so interesting because about two years ago, I heard email is dead. And then uh, since going out on my own, all I've heard is your email list is like your business is <laughs> life's blood. I'm like, that's mm-hmm. interesting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, very cool. Do you I know Stripe makes it. Um, easier, let's say, to to integrate like Apple Pay. Do you do things like that mm-hmm. in the plugin, or is that an add on? Or uh, we, you know, can do it for. We don't have like an add on or anything. I mean, it's definitely possible with the hooks that are in there. To if someone wanted to kind of roll their own or something like that. Honestly, we haven't had any requests for it. Interesting. Um, so we haven't, you know, dove into that side of things. We've got requests for tons of other things in our feature yeah. backlog. So that one just hasn't made it to the top of the list. Interesting. So, but it's definitely possible if you wanted to. Cool. Very cool. That's um, that. I really like that answer. I I didn't prep you on that or anything, so I didn't, <laughs> I didn't mean to like blindside you. But um, I guess as somebody in the tech field, I just kind of assumed that uh, Apple Pay would be a popular thing. But I I guess people probably users probably prefer the act of putting the credit card in if they're gonna give their money to people. Mm-hmm. So interesting uh, and. So uh, you mentioned that you have a big backlog. Uh, what are your plans for the future of the plugin? Uh, as much as you're willing to say, of course, you know, I don't need like a mm-hmm. hard date or a road. I don't want to tie you to anything. But what are you, what are you working on for the next release, let's say? Yeah, so our biggest kind of thing we're working on right now is working on subscriber engagement and getting data around that. Because uh, you can do a whole lot more with data whenever you know who the user is. Mm-hmm. You know, kind of, you know, what's their path to subscribe? How do you keep people from churning out? How do you add more value to a subscriber to keep them around? Um, you know, what what kind of content is a subscriber using? Uh, what are they viewing? Um, and then who hasn't come in a while so you can reach out to those people? So having data points around that and then creating kind of automation around reaching out to those people and just helping with subscriber engagement is our next big kind of set of tools that we're working on that will integrate with Leaky Paywall. 
That's fantastic. And that's something that I've heard echoed in other interviews at the end of season four. Uh, you know, I, I had an interview with um, Becca Rice of Jilt and, and she talked about stuff like that too, figuring out engagement and, and how to, to um, you know, figure out who's browsing your site maybe before they put an email address in or you know, capturing that email address as soon as possible because Jilt uh, does abandoned carts and it's mm-hmm. not very useful if you don't know who to send the emails to. So <laughs> yeah, um, we're actually using them on our Z101 site right now. So n- nice. They are. So, uh, well, at the time of this recording, uh, this, ep- this episode is going to be in season five. Um, but they were definitely a sponsor for season four. Uh, and I'm a big, big fan of their work. So, mm-hmm. um, I'll, I'll link them in the show notes if you want to go check them out as well. Um, Cool. So uh, I'll end with my favorite question, which is, do you have any trade secrets for us? <laughs> um, I would say the biggest thing is dog fooding your product as much as possible. And for us, that wasn't in us using it, you know, personally, like we don't have a publication, but by building client sites uh, with the plugin, we're really able to see what works and what doesn't and kind of what features are missing, what could be improved, you know, even from the admin area. Like a lot of requests we get is like the person managing the subscribers needs more, you know, Mm -hmm. tools and stuff like that. Um, So I would say just dog fooding your product, using it, you know, on real world sites and seeing how it's actually being used in the wild. You'll learn a ton. Man, that's it. That is fantastic advice as somebody coming from, uh, well, I used to work in higher ed for a while and it was very clear that uh, the people making the products were not in higher ed. (laughs) <laughs> uh, <laughs> so uh, definitely you will have a better product if you uh, use the product as well so it's just like uh, you know you take like a design that has like the perfect amount of text in the design uh, you want to make sure that you're using real text and not like the perfect size headline because you can't always guarantee that a headline is going to be exactly I don't know 30 mm-hmm. characters or whatever So exactly or yeah. those photos in themes that can't actually use and if you don't have good photography the theme sucks right exactly (laughs) right that's that's the biggest criticism i've heard of squarespace is like if you don't have good photography your squarespace site is not going to look good so (laughs) awesome well uh uh jeremy thanks for joining me today i really appreciate it i'm glad you reached out uh Mm, where yeah where can people find you uh they can find me personally at green hornet 79 on twitter and then you know, zine101.com is where all our stuff is. Nice. Green Hornet, are you a, are you a fan of the Green Hornet? Um, actually, it's kind of a story, but I had a 79 Ford F-150 pickup in high school. Nice. And uh, had completely restored it, and it was kind of a metallic green. So my grandpa called it the Green Hornet. So I've stuck with me since high school. Well, that was an absolutely fantastic way to end the show. So uh, thanks again to jeremy for joining me today i really appreciate uh, everything that he talked about his story about his grandfather the insights into creating a paywall and of course his development environment and i want to thank our sponsors once again thanks to pantheon and tech memes ride home podcast definitely check both of those out those are completely free for you uh so go ahead and head over to the appropriate sites and check them out. Their support is deeply appreciated. The question of the week for you is, have you considered adding a paywall to your site? Maybe you have a blog or a news site. Maybe you have a podcast or online courses that you maybe drip out some for free. Uh, And have you considered adding a paywall to that? So let me know on Twitter at jcasabona or email me at Joe at howibuilt.it. Don't forget to check out the new t-shirts and mugs over at the howibuilt.it slash shop. And for all the show notes, head over to howibuilt.it slash 94. If you liked the show, head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a rating and review. It helps people discover us. You can also join the Facebook community over at howibuilt.it slash Facebook. We ask the question of the week over there too so you can talk to other listeners about the episode and the question of the week and things like that. I really want to build a strong community around this podcast and Facebook is the place to do it. So that's everything for me until next time, get out there and build something. <laughs>